We're having church. I hope you are, wherever you are. It's a real strong presence of the Lord here. And we're going to crack open the Word and have a meal because the Bible is food. We eat it, and it nourishes us spiritually. Um, this time of year, we just celebrated the resurrection two Sundays ago. And this is the time in Israel's history where Jesus rose uh, we know in the resurrection in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, they passed over and they got through the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was destroyed behind them. And that represents sin in our lives. But then they wandered for 50 days. I think you said 40 Easter, but it's 50, right? 50 days between Passover and in the Old Testament, 50 days later on Pentecost, Moses received the law from the Lord. In the New Testament, 50 days later, Jesus sent Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. That's a very famous part of the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. It was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And Jesus, before he ascended after the resurrection, he told him, go to Jerusalem and wait, and you will be endued with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we should be very, very grateful we live in this dispensation. But with that comes a higher accountability and responsibility because our bodies are now the temple of Holy Spirit. And we want him fully operational in our temple, and we want to see our body as a temple. That's why it's so good that we've been focusing on communion a lot, because that's a sign that you're asking the Lord. You want to commune with him and recognize yourself as a temple of the Lord. Uh, we do it every day. You know, we don't think that's a religious ritual. We, we commune with him every morning. First thing, let that be the first thing that you taste in your mouth is that wafer and, and the juice, whatever, however you do it. Trisha got these little designer cups now, like, wherever it is, but it's a little chalice, you know, like this big. But, you know, that's it. That's her taste. That's why she married me. She has really good taste. <laughs> so there's the bottom and there's the top. So, <laughs> yeah, like an hourglass. So I, I do want to jump in. We're in um, John chapter 20 is where the, the text verse comes from. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And you have to really ask yourself, do you feel like you've been sent on a mission? Because if you haven't, we're going to try to convince you that you should. And that we're not just here taking up time after we become Christians and waiting to go to heaven because it's so bad here in the earth. Can't wait for you to come back, Jesus. Well, he said, occupy until I come. And we should have a mindset of those kind of people that say, I'm here to make a difference in this world. Trisha quoted it earlier. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So if that's true of Jesus, and if our text verse is true, which we know it is, as the Father has sent me, as he's about to leave, he's saying, so I'm sending you, go about destroying the works of the devil in the earth. And the beautiful thing is, the apostles weren't any, you know, specially highly qualified people. They were just regular people that had walked with Jesus. And we're the same way. We don't have to feel intimidated if we don't think we live up to some standard. Because the Word of God and Holy Spirit living in you will take whatever you have, whatever you can bring Him, and say, I'll, I'll use you. If your heart is willing and your heart is open, that's what God looks at is our heart and our willingness. Do we want to be people that are chasing after his perfect will for our lives? You've had a lot more time probably. I know somebody corrected me the other day and said, well, not if you have young kids, you haven't had a lot more time because you're acting like the school teacher and, and the referee at home. My cameraman, I know, you know, would nod to that. So that's, you know, one, one other whole scenario, but for the people that have children that are grown and out of the house, they've had more time, they're working at home. How are you using it? If the Father is sending us the way he sent Jesus, and now Jesus commissions us to go, I'm asking people to start writing down and journaling, what's he showing you about your mission? What, what makes your heart sing? Where do you see your gifts? Where has there been a lot of good fruit in your life? Because Jesus used that kind of analogy. A good tree produces good fruit. If there's good fruit coming from your life, sow into that. If there's bad fruit coming, look for the root of that thing and clean it up, and, uh, and you'll be an effective minister of the gospel. But I just want to bring you back to the mindset of the apostles. Very normal, regular people, right? Not highly qualified in the natural, but willing to serve him. Um, so 
John chapter 20 is where the text verse comes. I just want to back up to John chapter 16 when Jesus was still with them before the crucifixion. In 1632, he says to them, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered. And if you remember, Peter said, No, no, not me. I'm not going to be scattered. I'll, I'll go with you right into the death. <laughs> and he probably meant it. But Jesus said, No, not really. Um, you're, you're fragile. And you're going to fold under the pressure of that thing. But I'm warning you in advance. I'm still going to be with you. I'm still going to use you, Peter, even though you might not be who you think you are. So John 16, 32, the hour's coming. Yes, you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. Jesus said, and yet, Jesus said, I'm not alone because the Father is with me. That's a word for today, isn't it? If you live alone, you're not alone because the Father is with you if you're a Christian. And that loneliness, the devil could just try to torment you but say, no, just like Jesus. Even though everybody else scattered from him, he's telling them, I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Verse 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. So again, with COVID-19, if the devil's been robbing your peace, say, no, I'm standing on this word right here. Verse John 16, 33 says, in me... Jesus, I'm going to have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. That's the promise that Jesus gives us. If you go to the next chapter, 17, in John, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Oh, well, anyway, if you read 15, 16, 17, Jesus, there's a lot of red letters in the red letter Bible. He's praying to the Father. And right now, he's praying in verse 11 of John 17, he's saying, Holy Father, I'm about to leave this world to return to be with you, but my disciples will remain here. That's you and me. Amen. We're still here. And he says in verse 15, I'm not asking you to remove them from this world, but I ask you that you guard their hearts from evil. So Jesus isn't saying that we should live in some protective bubble. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We're here to occupy until he comes. We're here to shine the light of Jesus to hurting people who don't have the answer that we have, the good news of the gospel. And it's not just the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the kingdom. If you want to do a word study, that's a good one. Look up how many times it says the gospel of the kingdom in the New Testament. It's often. And that's what Jesus' main message was, is that the kingdom of God is available to us right now here in the earth. It's among us. It's within us. It's available to us, but we need to access it. So in verse uh, 17, 15, he said, I'm not asking you to remove them from the world, but guard their heart from evil. We know that in the Lord's Prayer, he said the same thing. Deliver us from evil, right? So we're in the world, but we're going to be different kind of breed of people. We're a different breed of human being because Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the breath of God is empowering us differently than we were prior to knowing him and prior to him dwelling inside of us. Verse 16 says, For they no longer belong to this world any more than I do. Verse 18, here you go. It's just like what he says in a couple more chapters coming up. Here he says, I have commissioned them to represent me. This is the Passion Translation, okay? I've commissioned Trisha Roselli, Easter Fraser, Danny Hall, Peter Roselli, all the people here. I've commissioned you to represent me Jesus says to the Father, just as you commissioned me to represent you. Wow, did you know that? Did you know you were commissioned by Jesus to represent him here in the earth? I love the wording there. Verse 20 then says, and I asked not only for these disciples, that was 2,000 years ago, but also for the people that will be at King of Kings in the year 2020. <laughs> Let's say it that way. It says, but also for those who will one day believe in me through the message of this band of disciples who didn't look like much on the outside, but boy, people could tell they had been with Jesus. And that's what happens. If you jump to first, uh, sorry, chapter 20, we see that there was, some, there was some warning from Jesus saying, look, it's going to get a little hairy here. You're going to scatter. You're going to leave me alone. You don't think you will, but you will. You're going to scatter, but I'm not alone because the Father's going to be with me. So now it's after the resurrection, if we get to John chapter 20, and they're really freaked out, if I could use a modern-day term, because they're in fear. The disciples are in fear. 
They had heard a report from Mary Magdalene, who we talked about two Sundays ago on the Resurrection Sunday. She was the first one to talk to Jesus in the resurrection. How cool is that? That it was a woman. Not even one of the official disciples, right? But that Trisha commented about that, how wherever Jesus is Lord, women are held in high esteem, not less than. He's no respecter of persons. He loves us all. He respects us all, right? So verse 19 in John chapter 20, it says, That evening the disciples are gathered together, and because they were afraid of the reprisals of the Jewish leaders, they had locked the doors to the place where they met, okay? Exactly what Jesus told them would happen. But he said, don't be afraid. You have your peace in me. And, and they were losing their peace. And, and that can happen today in this environment that we're in. We can lose our peace. The, the isolation is affecting people differently. It depends on your, your makeup. I was talking to somebody today who's very much a people person and has lost several people that he knows to this COVID-19. And it's, it is rattling him. Other people don't mind the, the isolation as much because they're wired differently. But we have to look at everybody and say, God, help them, meet them where they're at, and help them prosper in this situation. The disciples are worried about getting killed themselves. They, they had been watching crucifixions for most of their lives. The Romans had been crucifying people a long time. And to see Jesus in that place, on that cross, being tortured the way he was, like the rug got pulled out from under them. Like, how could that be? How could he have been the Lord? And that could have happened to him. Did we put our trust in the right person? And though Mary said, I talked to him. I saw him. Oh. They were afraid, verse 19 says. And they had locked the doors. But suddenly, Jesus appeared among them, came right through the wall, right through the locked doors. And he said to them, peace be to you. And he told them, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. All right, so let's just back up for a second and look at what the timeline looks like when we start very all the way back at the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, right? We know it says that God spoke and the worlds were created. And then he created man. Man and woman were in one package until he took Adam's rib out and he had now he had man and woman. It wasn't good for man to be alone. And we sure know that's true these days because of how much time we're spending alone. All right, so the first Adam and Eve were in this perfect position in the garden until they sinned. And when they sinned, they brought death into the world. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So if you don't know him, your wages are going to be death and eternal separation from God. But if you do know him, you get this gift of eternal life through, through the Son. So for him to say, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, if you look at the assignment that God gave Jesus from heaven, it was go into the earth and be the second Adam. The first Adam messed it up. The first Adam brought death into the garden. I want you to go and defeat death. Do what he was supposed to do. And that's biblical language. He's called the second Adam in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. That's a great picture for us. Because we are now, in his absence physically, have been filled with his spirit. We are now the body of Christ in the earth. We can extend the reach because he could only be in one place at a time. We're all over the globe. There's over a billion Christians in the world right now. We are his body in the earth. But we better recognize the importance that he places on that in us and the responsibility that we have. As the Father sent him, he's sending us. But we don't always feel like we've been sent because we lose a vision and we lose a mission. And that's what I want you to remember, mission-minded and vision-driven. That's the phrase that the Lord gave me, a great, easy way to remember, a mission-minded and a vision-driven. And, and the Bible's clear about that. People who don't have a vision perish without a prophetic understanding of what I'm here for and why I'm here and the meaning for my life. I just... Been a lot of wheels, but don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. And I think that's probably true for some people that have had a lot of free time on their hands over the last month, at least in New Jersey. I know in other parts of the country, it's not quite as big of a lockdown as it's been here, but we're the second state after New York. Uh, it seems like our, our rules here have been more restrictive than other places. 
and it's affecting people you know, badly. So I don't want it to. I want you to use the time to redeem it and say, okay, Lord, I want to hear my marching orders from me. I want to be more clear. I want to be more mission-driven in the way I get up every morning and know that there's a purpose for my life. And I want to be vision-driven. I want to know that you've given me a vision that I'm shooting for. And Paul, you know, you've heard the, the verse in Philippians that said, I'm pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that you set for me. That's how we should feel every morning when we wake up. Huh. All right, so I'm going to keep going because I, I want to get through some other scriptures here. Verse 22 is key. John 20, verse 22 says, Then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's different than the second chapter of Acts when Holy Spirit comes on everybody, but he breathes on them. And I think it's really clearly there to say, you really are now going to take my place. I was the second Adam. God breathed on me. And the same way God breathed on the first Adam in the garden, I'm now breathing on you to empower you to do what I was here to do too. And even though you're not as qualified as I was, <laughs> humanity, you're still going to get it done because my spirit's going to be living on the inside of you and you can access the power of the word of God. But you need to metabolize the word. It's got to defeat the lies the enemy is going to try to get you to live by. So he breathes on them, just like God breathed into the dead body of Adam. God breathed life into them. Now all of a sudden the apostles have a new gift, and it gets enhanced on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts where we read about it. But this was the start of it. And we see a radical change in someone like Peter who... When Jesus was being crucified, he clearly fled and denied the Lord. And yet in the New Testament, he's a totally different person. He's a pillar, a, a rock in the church because that's what God does. He changes our nature. He restores and renews us and gives us the purpose that we were always supposed to have, not the counterfeit version that the enemy has. And there's many people in the Bible that I could say mission-minded and vision-driven. Mission-minded and vision-driven. That's what I want to say about me. I remember when I first got a job um, outside my family's business, and we were going around the table and just saying, like, what do we think about the other people in the room? Like, what's one of the expressions that you think of when you think of Joe or Sam or whoever? And then they came to me, and the guy next to me said, Pete's a man on a mission. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. But I took that as a compliment because... I had a goal. I knew where I wanted to go, and, I, and that's really important to understand that that's God's plan for us. All right, I just I wrote a few down. Abraham, he had to be mission-minded because God said, I want you to leave. I'm not going to tell you where to go yet, but I want you to go, and then I will give you the vision for the promised land. Joseph, in prison, all kinds of bad things happened. He could have easily bailed out. But he was mission-minded. Even in the prison, he was given prophetic words and interpreting dreams for people. And years later, somebody said, oh, I know somebody who can interpret your dream. I forgot about that guy. And then Joseph goes from the pit to the palace and takes over the, the assignment that God had given him. And then he interprets the vision and then saves the whole country, basically, because of the presence of God in him. You could look at, at King David, who I already talked about mission-minded, he's going to kill Goliath. Nobody else wanted to kill him. Here's a teenage boy comes, all these soldiers there, they were all backing down, and he gets up and says, no, I'm a mission. There's a cause. The cause is the kingdom of God is going to rule, not this uncircumcised Philistine. Uncircumcised means you are not in relationship with God. We are. We're in covenant relationship. That's why you're going down. Daniel was in Babylon, was put in charge, risked his life, needed to get a, a quick word in season, or he and his friends were going to die. Mission-minded, God gave him the answer, vision-driven. God showed him what the dream was of the king. Over and over, there's so many examples. Esther, Nehemiah, John the Baptist, of course, Jesus. We know he was on a mission. But then Paul, and that's who I'll spend the, the rest of this time with here. i got a little bit of time left. And I'm going to go to uh, the version of the Bible called The Voice. I don't know if all of you have uh, heard about it or gotten a hold of it. It's got some really powerful translations. I'm in Philippians chapter 3. 
And I'm reading from the voice, uh, verse 12. And it's a big chapter. I wish I could unpack it. Maybe I, I plan on unpacking it a little bit more on Sunday. So tune in on Sunday for more of this. But this is how, how the voice says it. I'm not there, there yet. Okay? He was talking about, if you remember other versions, I have not arrived. I'm not there yet. I'm not where I know I'm going to be, but I'm also not where I was. Amen. And I've said it before, but my present situation is not an indication of my future destination. I'm going somewhere. I'm mission-minded, and I'm vision-driven, and I have a vision for where God wants me to go. And just because I'm not there yet doesn't mean I'm not getting there. So that's what Paul says. I'm not there yet, nor have I become perfect, but I am charging on to gain anything and everything the anointed one Jesus has in store for me. And nothing will stand in my way because he has grabbed me and he won't let me go. <laughs> I love this version. And then verse 13 says, brothers and sisters, as I said, I know I have not arrived, but there's one thing I'm doing. I'm leaving my old life behind. Okay? That's a decision that you have to make. It could be tempting. Boy, do we know that in the last, what, 15 years? How many people found an old friend on Facebook and it went way too far in the wrong direction, right? Well, that's a temptation that you got to guard your heart against. Guard us from evil. Lord, they're going to be in the world. Guard their hearts from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from the evil in this world. He's given us the tools for it, but we have to know how to guard our heart, right? All right, there's one thing I'm doing. I'm leaving my old life behind, putting everything on the line for this mission. There's the wording right there in the voice, Philippians 3.13. I'm putting everything on the line for this mission. Jesus says, the Father sent you, so you're sending me. I'm going to spend the rest of my life here trying to fulfill that calling that you placed on my life. And you'll keep refining it. You'll keep making it clearer to me what it should be. I wrote it down this way. For my own way I interpret it was, I will continually pursue God's dynamic blueprint. Normally, we think of a blueprint, it's a scroll, and you open it up, and it's just in one dimension right here, right? You see it just flat on a piece of paper. But the picture the Lord gave me was us being inside a three-dimensional blueprint where you could see the walls and the height and the depth, and it was changing because that's the plan that God has for you. It's dynamic. It's changing. Each day when you wake up, there's a cause in your life and there's a mission, but he keeps refining you and keeps fine-tuning you, and the building keeps getting better because you're getting further away from that old lifestyle. The lies don't have the grip on you they used to have because your mind is being renewed by the Word of God. So I love that picture, a dynamic blueprint. It's a 3D dynamic blueprint. So I will continually pursue God's dynamic blueprint to advance his kingdom in the earth. You come up with your own. That's the one I came up with. Right, so I'm almost not quite, but I'm getting there. Oh, God, this is so rich. Verse 14 in Philippians 3. I'm sprinting towards the only goal that counts. <laughs> That's the one that we know as I'm pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call. I'm sprinting toward the only goal that counts, to cross the line, to win the prize, and to hear God's call to resurrection life found exclusively in Jesus the anointed. Hope you read the voice, man. It's got some good stuff in there. Then we were on a call this morning with the men's ministry, which is awesome. Starts at 7.30 every Tuesday. If you're part of our church, even if you're not, you know, jump in. And one of the guys on the call is, is Greek by birth, so he knows Greek. He's fluent in the Greek language. And we were talking about the Great Commission, right, where we know it as, go ye therefore into all the nations, preach the gospel, teach them. I'm, I'm summarizing it, right? But there, that's part of that mission-driven piece, too, is go. Don't just sit, but go ye, therefore, and preach the gospel. And make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do all the things that I showed you to do. So don't just tell them, but show them. Live it out as an example before them. And he said, there's one way you can take that word go and say, in your going, which puts a different spin on it. And it was really an eye-opener for me to say, you know what, this is part of that mission-driven and, and that vision that you have is to say, wait a minute, I'm mission-minded. As I'm going today, the Lord's going to put opportunities in my path to talk to people that I don't know, but I'm going to be ready for it because that's part of my vision. 
a mission mind, dude. As I go about my business, in your going, preach the gospel and make disciples. Boy, that really helped me. So that's what it says in, in a, a different version called Douay Rheims Bible. Go and therefore teach ye all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, this is the part I really wanted to remember here. I am always, even unto the end of the world, with you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Do you see how the same thing Jesus said? I'm not alone. You're going to scatter when they come to get me, but I'm not alone because I'm always with the Father. That's a good promise. Ephesians chapter 3 in the New Living Translation, another one I like. Verse 10, God's purpose in all of this. All right, now, again, I'm kind of jumping in the middle of chapter 3. But God had a purpose for the plan that he has for your life. And I love the way it summarizes it here. God's purpose in all of this that we're talking about is to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety, not just to other people, okay? That would be one thing. But to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, all right? And if you think about Jesus picking these 12 disciples, really none of those first 12 had any kind of real scholarly background. They were mostly blue-collar people. When the Apostle Paul came, they definitely had a scholar in the group. That was later. Uh, but he chose not to even be full-time a scholar. He was still working, making tents, right? So all Jesus was a carpenter, and the 12 disciples were all people from the marketplace. So the idea that they had some kind of special qualifications, you lose that idea. God takes the things that are not and calls them as though they are, right? So Things that might have been spoken over you, you're never going to make it. You won't amount to anything. You're going to be just like your father who was an alcoholic or whatever. Those are word curses spoken over your life. That's not what God is saying about you. And I'm not minimizing some of that stuff that's been said to us. We need to get healed from that trauma. But the point is, there's, he's choosing to use the church. Look at the wording here. God's purpose was to use the church to display his wisdom. That's us. That's just regular, everyday people. No big qualifications. He uses us to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. He uses us to do it. The ecclesia. Verse 11. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. And verse 12 is that allegiance we have to Jesus because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We don't have to cower and worry that he's going to punish us. No, God's Abba Father, he loves us. We're adopted into his family, and he wants to give us our daily strategy. And that's just another great thing about starting your day with communion. You're, su you're surrendering yourself. You're getting on your knees and say, Lord, you're the most important thing to me today. I can do nothing without you, but I want to commune with you and remind myself, my flesh and my spirit, man, that I can't go tipping off into this world. That's going to be death. I'm going to be in the world, and I want to make a difference in the world. I'm mission-minded, but I need your vision to be the thing that's driving me, not the world's vision. So I'm going to finish up in Acts chapter 4, and I'm reading from the message now, another one of my translations that I really like. There's so, the BibleGateway.com is free. There's a bunch of different translations on there. It's really interesting to read it. I also like BibleHub.com because it'll stack like 15 to 20 different versions on one verse at a time, and you can just go right down there and, and, and read them, and it really brings out the rich texture of the word. So the message in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, uh, I'm kind of jumping in in the middle again of a story because I just want to get to a specific point I'm trying to make here, especially about Peter, because remember, he was the one that denied Christ, even though he said, I'll go and die for you. I'll never leave you. And Jesus said, oh, yeah, before this is over, before the cock crows three times in the morning, you'll have to deny me three times. Before you hear the cock crow in the morning, you'll have to deny me three times. And it, Peter couldn't believe it and then found out it was true. So there's a side of us that, we think we're something that we're really not until he comes in and fills that space with his presence in us and says, I've got a redemption plan for you. Follow it. Jump in with both feet. Pursue it. Race after it because it's a good plan. So he had done that. And, and they had 
seen this man healed in Acts chapter 3, and they were, putting, they were being put on trial for this man getting healed. And they were brought before the authorities, the Sanhedrin. So in Acts chapter 4, it says, With that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, let loose. Rulers and leaders of the people, if we have been brought to trial today for helping a sick man, <laughs> if we're put under investigation regarding this healing, I'll be com completely frank with you, we have nothing to hide. <laughs> this is a guy who was hiding from a little servant girl the night before Jesus was crucified. His character changed. He's the one that tells us in his letter that we have access to the divine nature of God. And he's experiencing it right here. He says, I'll be completely frank with you. We have nothing to hide. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that the one you killed on the cross and God raised from the dead, by the means of his name, this man stands before you whole today. You want to know what happened? All we did was call on the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, like we sang. And, and they could see he's just a regular guy. Call on the name of Jesus. And then it goes on to say, Jesus is the stone that you masons threw out, which is now the cornerstone. He's quoting a verse from the Old Testament that they all knew. And then he says this kind of closing statement, salvation comes no other way. No other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Only this one name that we sang about tonight, Jesus. <laughs> verse 13. I love this. They couldn't take their eyes off of them. Peter and John standing there so confident and so sure of themselves. <laughs> their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in scripture or formal education. And they recognized them as companions of Jesus. Oh, remember that, please. I hope that's what people say about us. I hope that's the impact that we have, that people look, their fascination deepened, like, wait a minute, where'd you get all this knowledge? You're obviously from Galilee, your accent shows that. You're a blue collar guy. How are you telling us what the scriptures are being fulfilled right now? We're the educated people. Well, the Holy Spirit comes alive inside of us and gives us revelation. Verse 13 uh, in the message says, but with the man, man right before them, the, the, the man that was healed standing right before them, <laughs> he was upright and so healed. What could they say against that? It was obvious that God had done a miracle for this man. Verse 15 says, they sent them out of the room so that they could work out a plan. This is the Sanhedrin. And they talked it over. What can we do with these men? By now it's known all over the town that a miracle has occurred and that they're behind it. There's no way we can refute that. But so it doesn't go any further. Let's silence them with threats so they won't dare to use Jesus' name ever again with anyone. <laughs> that was 2,000 years ago. That name is above every other name. And it's been used many millions and billions of times since then. So this plan wasn't going to work because the apostles weren't going to give into it. Just like David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? coming against the God that we serve. No, not happening. So they threatened him. In verse 18, they called Peter and John back in and warned them that they were on no account ever again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And here's Peter, the new version of Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with confidence. Peter and John spoke right back. Whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than God, you decide. As for us, there's no question. <laughs> we can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. I hope that's your confession as well. This is too good to keep to ourselves. The, the message that he gave us isn't just good advice. It's good news. It's news about a life that you can have, not free from problems. You're going to have problems, but you're going to have more tools to offset those problems. You're going to have resurrection life living right on the inside of you, that's going to counter the death that the devil's trying to send against you. It says, this is my last verse, the religious leaders renewed their threats, but then they released them. They couldn't come up with a charge that would stick, that would keep them in jail. The people would not have stood for it. They were all praising God over what had happened. 
And, you know, it's really clear in the Bible what happens when one sinner repents and turns from that sin and comes to God. You go from feeling somewhat aimless and purposeless to coming into a relationship with a living God who loves you and fills you with his spirit. And if you get plugged into a body of believers called the church, that, that's a life-giving place that's going to give you relationships with people that will be good role models for you. Then you just grow. That's what happens. You just grow in the knowledge of God. And, and the things that you've been denied maybe in your life, you didn't see the most perfect examples. You're still not seeing perfect examples, but you're seeing people who are serving a perfect God and have found out how to work this Bible into their everyday living and, and that's clearly what God wants for us, is to be part of a life-giving body of believers. It's really this isolation has tried to cancel that, but it's not going to cancel it. Because the body of Christ is still connecting on every other possible way out there. Live streams like this, Zoom calls, a million ways. We're not letting the devil win. Just like Peter and John said, there's no question in our minds. We're not denying him. You decide, we're going to serve God, not man. So we hope that you make that decision as well because we know just from the amount of views that we see on our Facebook page that there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily just part of our local body here but that you're watching and that you're seeing this. And if you're, if you're questioning, we just want to tell you that the few of us that are here today said it was the best decision that we ever made. In my case, it was 1983, so a long time ago. Best decision in, in the spiritual realm, best decision in the natural, marrying my wife is the next best decision say it all the time because it's true but right now if you don't know him this is the day you can make the decision you can say i'm done living that old lifestyle i'm going to pursue i want to be mission-minded in a different way i want to i want to do god's mission in my life i want to be vision driven of god's vision in my life and it's really not that hard you just can say a prayer you, you might think well i don't qualify well, I've been talking all night about how none of the apostles look like they qualified, right? But he picks you because you're made in his image. And he loves you. And you might not even figure out why he loves you. None of us can figure out why. It wasn't because we, we deserved it and we earned that love. It's God's grace. If Adam hadn't sinned, we would have had a whole different world. But because Adam did sin, Jesus came to be that second Adam. Remember what I said in John 20? He breathes life, and all of a sudden, what was dead comes to life. So if that's you, we're just going to say a prayer. You could say it with us. Would you guys stand up in the front here, and, and let's just repeat it out loud so they can join in with us. You don't have to know how all this is going to play out in your life. Don't worry. Just say yes to the Lord. He'll meet you right where you're at. Every one of us here could tell you when we said this prayer, we didn't know how it was going to play out, but he met us exactly right where we were at, and we knew in that week, two weeks, three weeks after, this isn't some, you know, far away, distant God. He's right here. He's making himself real to me in so many different ways. So let's say it out loud, okay? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard good news tonight. In spite of my past mistakes, you still love me. You went to the cross to take the punishment, that death, that my sin would earn me. But if I come to you, you substitute yourself for me and take my punishment on your back. I don't fully understand how you could love me that much. But by faith, I take a step of faith and say yes to your lordship over my life. I turn from my sinful ways and I turn towards a loving God. I have lots of questions, but I trust that you will answer those questions. I ask you, Lord, fill me with your spirit, with your life, Grant me that eternal life and bring people into my life that will help teach me and give me life-giving relationships. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today in Jesus' name. That's great news. If you said yes to that prayer, please reach out to us. Our website is kingofkingswc.com. Okay, you can find us easily and reach out to us. We'll send you a Bible. 
We'll talk to you on the phone. We'll help you understand what the next steps are of how you can move forward in this and, and receive that power, that good news that Jesus Christ loved us enough to die for us and, and say yes to you to become adopted into his family. We want to follow our, our regulations here in the state, so that's it for our service tonight. Glad you could be with us. We'll be back again here Sunday, and then next Tuesday will be the last time that we live stream for here, and, and then we'll show you our new location where we're going. But like Easter said, we passed over. We're going into that next promised land that the Lord gave us. Have a great night. We love you.